edition of Pro Wrestling Radio. My name is Eric Gargiulo, and I will be here until 1 o'clock talking about the sport of professional wrestling. Now, I will be joined by former WWF World Heavyweight Champion, Hall of Fame inductee, and just one of the all-time great superstar Billy Graham in about 10 minutes. I just talked to him. He's running a little bit behind. So uh, I will be joined by Billy Graham at about quarter after 12. I will take your calls with Billy Graham once he comes on the show. We'll ask him a couple of questions, and then I'll start taking calls at about 20, 25 after. And you will have your chance to talk to one of the all-time greats, superstar Billy Graham. And what he did tell me was that he wants to be asked the tough questions. If you have a question about Vince McMahon, about drug abuse, about steroid abuse, Billy Graham, one of those controversial figures in this sport, He's a self-admitted ex-drug addict. He used steroids, one of the pioneers of bringing steroids into the professional wrestling business, and he has no problem saying so. And he also has no problems telling you the effects to his body today and how it has affected him and his family and his career, which is very negatively. But Billy Graham does not mind being asked the tough questions. And Billy was very outspoken following the tragic deaths of Nancy Benoit, Chris Benoit's son, and, of course, Chris Benoit himself. So uh, Billy Graham was very outspoken about drug abuse in professional wrestling, and Billy will be here today talking about that, talking about his career, and really anything else that you want to ask him. So that will be coming up in less than 10 minutes. Superstar Billy Graham, one of my all-time favorites. I mean, I uh, sometimes just sit and search through YouTube on my uh, on my downtime and just look for old superstar Billy Graham promos because uh, you know just what an innovator of the interview superstar Billy Graham was I mean just um, really what a pioneer of the wrestling business today what we see today all the showmanship the entertainment the glamour uh, you know a lot of people will point back to gorgeous George as the man that pioneered that and yes he definitely changed the way professional wrestling was presented, but superstar Billy Graham just took it to a whole other level. And um, I'm really, really excited to be talking to superstar Billy Graham. I love having the old-time greats on the show because it was just such a different era, and I just have so much respect for those gentlemen and women from that era. And uh, Billy Graham, he's got such a great story. I mean, I've read his book. I've watched his DVD. I've watched countless interviews. I've read countless interviews with him. And um, he's a guy that doesn't pull any punches. So, uh, you know, it'll be interesting to uh, hear what the superstar has to say. And, of course, due to the shortened time, I expected him for the hour. Uh, we're getting him for about 45, 40 minutes. Uh, Billy Graham will reschedule and have him back for another hour sometime in the new year. So I'm going to come up at 12.15, superstar Billy Graham. Uh, a couple of quick things that I'll hit on before we go to Superstar Billy Graham. Ric Flair, his legacy is in jeopardy. And I wrote a lengthy piece on phillyburbs.com this week taking a look at Ric Flair and his legacy. You know, I was one of many who beat the drum. Be fair to Flair. Give him one last chance. He deserves that last opportunity. I was one of many who said that here, who wrote about it. I'm a big Ric Flair fan. I mean, one of my all-time favorites, watching Ric Flair really takes me back to my teenage years, my childhood, and I think that we all love and respect what Ric Flair has given us as fans, especially the fans that grew up watching Ric Flair in his prime and even the years thereafter. But the Ric Flair that I watched 
on Monday Night Raw two weeks ago wrestling Randy Orton. Uh, win or not, wow, just what a, a far cry from the Ric Flair we grew up with. And, you know, yeah, you give him some leeway because he is Ric Flair. He's coming up on his 59th birthday, and we understand that. But, I mean, my goodness, Ric Flair looked every bit of his age and then some. You know, there are guys that have wrestled in their 70s. And while they may look to be elderly, they don't exactly look their age. But, man, Ric Flair looked like what my grandfather, God bless his soul, if he was still alive, would look like if he was in there wrestling at 59. I mean, he just did not look good. It did not look good for the entire WWE, for fans that aren't aware of the legacy of Ric Flair, and they're just tuning in and watching this guy, they're thinking, why is this this grandfather being able to hang in there with Randy Orton? I mean, if you ever watch back, especially on WWE 24-7, and you see those old-school television shows, and you see those old enhancement matches, you know, the jobbers, the preliminary wrestlers, those guys all looked like Ric Flair back then. And there was a reason for that. You know, you had your guys that looked like wrestlers against the guys that actually looked like enhancement talent. And Ric Flair is far from an enhancement talent. But that was the view and the opinion. If you're watching for the first time, you're just not familiar with Flair or you don't understand his accomplishment, um, you know, his accomplishments in the sport of professional wrestling. And it's a darn shame that he has to go out like that. But now, they are reconsidering. They're talking about pulling the plug on the entire program. And where will this leave Flair from here? You know, here's a guy that's been divorced many times over. He's had his, his struggles with the government. Uh, you know, his, his financial woes have been well documented. Here's a guy that, sadly enough, needs to be wrestling right now, but shouldn't be wrestling right now. So uh, what do you do with him? Do you just let him walk away and, and, and go into TNA? I mean, TNA will take him, and TNA will, will put him on top and, uh, you know, do whatever it is that Flair wants to do. TNA will make him champion, and it would be a big boost of credibility to TNA. Uh, I think he would do more for TNA than he could do right now for the WWE. I think you can say that about a lot of people. But what do you do with Ric Flair? It's, it's a real interesting question, and this Monday... The 15-year anniversary of Raw, real interesting situation is going to be presented because they are advertising the return, the one-night reunion of Evolution. Batista, Triple H, Ric Flair, and Randy Orton. Obviously, there is some kind of an angle coming out of this, but how do you put these four together without acknowledging what's been going on in recent weeks with Flair and Triple H and Randy Orton and Batista? Well, Batista out of the equation. And it just goes to show you, too, you know, you can... Have your criticism of Triple H. You can have your criticism of Ric Flair. But there is something to be said that they took two young guys that were floundering around in Randy Orton and Batista back at that time, put them into evolution, took them on the road, showed them the ropes, uh, tugged with them every night. And now these two guys are the flagship stars of the top two shows in professional wrestling in Raw and SmackDown. So some credit has to be given out, especially where it is due. So it'll be interesting to see what happens this coming Monday on the 15-year anniversary of Raw. This should be a really fun show. They're advertising a lot of people coming back. Uh, it was leaked out this week that Tammy Sitch, uh, a girl I've worked with many times in wrestling, she's finally going to be back on Raw. And I know that is something that Tammy wanted to do for a long time, but she wanted to make sure she was back in sunny shape before she got there, and it took her a long time to do it. It was a long, hard road, but she looks absolutely phenomenal, and she's going to be back on Raw. It would not surprise me if this somehow turned into a job somewhere down the line for Tammy Sitch, and which is what an incredible story uh, her story is. But, yes, Tammy Sitch will be back. Trish Stratus will be back on Raw for the first time in a long time. Lita being rumored to be back on Raw. Of course, the usual suspects returning, Steve Austin, Mick Foley, Eric Bischoff, all back on Raw. Hulk Hogan, a name you didn't think would be back on Raw anytime soon. He's coming back, and don't tell me his divorce didn't have anything to do with this. Hogan is back and willing to do business, and losing 50% of your assets will do that to you. But Hogan will be back this Monday on Raw. There are rumors that The Rock may show up with some kind of a tape segment, but uh, it should be a really fun show. We'll talk a lot about that next week on Raw. So, what I am going to do is I'm going to take a quick timeout. I'm going to line up 
the superstar himself, Billy Graham. I'll give him a call back. We'll get him up on the air when we come back from the break. We will talk to the legendary superstar Billy Graham. And during the course of the next 45 minutes, I will take your calls for this incredible legend, superstar Billy Graham. And uh, I'll ask you to hold off on calling for uh, for about 10 minutes. And uh, about 5, 10 minutes into the interview, if you want to start calling, um, that's fine. And we'll uh, try and get in as many calls as possible. So coming up after the break, scheduled to join us, superstar Billy Graham. And I am so excited about this one. I think it's going to be a great one. Well, you're listening to the radio show in a couple of different places. One, live on the Internet, on WBCB1490.com. Archived on my website at ProWrestlingRadio.com. But on the air, WBCB 1490 AM. And now, Dr. Moore, Russell Talk with the man himself, Eric Gargiulo. Very much, Bill Melody. And without further ado, this is a show that I've been excited about, man, for quite some time. I've had a lot of great guests on here over the last nine and a half years. But this is a man that I have always wanted, and now we have him. He is a former Triple WF. World Heavyweight Champion, a Hall of Fame inductee, and one of my all-time favorites. Superstar Billy Graham, welcome to the show. Hey, thank you, Eric. It's good to be here, buddy. And I, I didn't realize, uh, listening to your, your tag here, that you've been on for nine and a half years? Yes, sir. Wow, well, you must be one of the original uh, guys doing doing this. And... Uh, uh, that's a long time to be doing doing these interviews. Yeah, it's pretty it's, it's pretty crazy. The time I, I just had uh, Chris Jericho on about two weeks ago. Yes, and he was the very first guest that I had back in um, 1999 or so, or whenever it was we started. And it was just pretty ironic uh, having the guys on now that have gone on to become bigger stars that back in the day were just you know uh, kind of on the cusp of things. Oh sure, yes, yes, of course, and. Uh uh, Chris Chris Jericho is just a, a great uh, a great guy, as you know, yes. and uh, his talent boy. He just has so much talent that, of course, I think his his real talent is in his um, speaking ability. Of course, you yes. know his promo abilities. He just he's just awesome, you know. Yes, I- and uh, I tell you, Philadelphia, you know that's uh, that's one of my top three uh, favorite towns, along with Boston, New York, and then Philadelphia. Uh, as far as wrestling towns, uh, the fans there are just, you, you just can't, uh, you can't beat the East Coast fans for intensity uh, anyway, you know. Yeah. Uh, but those folks, uh, you know, they're in Philadelphia. It's just, uh, there's nothing like it. And it's been, it's been great, you know. Yeah. With the, did, did your opponents, uh, when you wrestled on the East Coast um, in your heyday uh, as champion and leading up to such, did your opponents, um, the baby faces, did they become frustrated because you would come out there and, and be cheered, which is something at that time unheard of in the wrestling business? Uh, yeah, it was a, uh, it, it, it uh, eventually, uh, you know, the fans uh, uh, started making uh, those early posters, you know, Superstar Billy Graham and stuff like that. And uh, a lot of the fans started making homemade T-shirts and hmm. stuff. I've got some great photos. Uh, that have been uh, collected over the years by fans. Uh, now that we have the internet, it's, it's great. You know, yeah. uh, folks uh, can can you know they find stuff and they can email it to you. And so I've got a real treasure trove of uh, photographs of, of all my uh, all my babyface fans when I was uh, heel champ. You know, and uh, of course uh, I, I think I think Eric the the deal is the East Coast fans. Um, uh, you know, I, I think they're they're a different breed of fans. They're they're far more uh, intense, and um, uh, they they really enjoyed being um, uh, entertained. You yeah. know, and uh, and I, I uh, you know Philadelphia. I remember the uh, all of, almost all of my matches there at the Spectrum. You know, yeah, and uh, especially that uh, you want to talk about later the the great cage match with Bruno there. You know. Yeah, well, let's talk about it now. I've had, I've had Bruno. Bruno's um, uh, one of uh, probably my most frequent guests that I've had on over the nine years or so, and uh, we've talked about your matches. Uh, you know, since you touched on it, and I had the question written down here, especially for the, the local fans that are listening, what do you remember about that night that you turned away thousands playing Bruno in the cage? Uh, yeah, that, that, was a, uh, that was a great night. Uh, I remember... Uh uh, I was at the old uh, Philadelphia Hotel right there on the airport, Philadelphia Airport Hotel, mm. and uh, watching the news. And uh, 
the five o'clock news uh, in Philadelphia w- was coming on, and, and they were saying, uh, you know, that the, they had five to ten thousand fans out front of the Spectrum, and nobody uh, could get in, and they'll go there. It's, you know, it's sold out. You got, uh, you know, all these thousands of folks on the streets, and uh, it was a real uh, uh, that that event that uh, cage match with Bruno set the all-time attendance record for the uh, for the spectrum at about almost 20 a little over 20,000 fans uh, inside the spectrum and i remember they had put extra seats in wow. and there was about maybe two feet between the front row seats and the ring you know yeah uh, it was just an awesome awesome uh, turnout and support of the fans and uh, uh, of course, I don't think we let the fans down. I think we gave them a real good match in that cage. And uh, uh, that stays with me as probably and other wrestling historians like Dave Meltzer, for instance, have said that that, that event and my drawing power in the, in the Philadelphia spectrum, having all the sellouts, sellouts that I had there was far more impressive than all the sellouts I had in Mass Square Garden because, of course, of the um, uh, the population, you know, 10, 15 million people in, in New York, you're going to draw a lot of folks, you know. Yeah. But to sell out the, the spectrum the way uh, the way we did was was really in history a, a very, very more important uh, as far as historians go than, than in the, the New York Madison Square Garden. See, so it's a, it's a great thing. It's a great compliment, you know. That, that's, that's awesome. That's awesome. We are talking to superstar Billy Graham. Uh, something I want to ask you, and I'm going to jump around here, uh, you know, in the time that I have you. Um, something that Bruno talks about sometimes on the show is when he came back in, um, in the mid-'80s or so when he was teaming with David and that thing, and then you um, came back subsequently thereafter, um, Bruno says a lot of it uh, was because the houses weren't doing as well as people think with Hogan on top. So Vince wanted Bruno back then. You know, Vince wanted people like yourself back, people that were proven draws. Do you think there's anything to that? Um, I don't. I, I have never analyzed that question, Eric. That's a very, very good question and analysis by, uh, by Bruno. I know that uh, take me out of the equation and just leave Bruno in mm-hmm. uh, because he would be, uh, yes, he would be the man you would go to uh, when you need a guarantee, uh, uh, you know, for folks to, uh, to to fill up the house, you know. Yeah. Because I know once I uh, pass the torch over to uh, Backlund that many, many, many matches uh Bruno and I were on the same card supporting uh, in a supportive role of Backlund and his uh, defense of his of his belt at that time. Mm-hmm. And it was obvious that Bruno was really the one who drew the house. Yeah. And uh, it was a uh, it was a ploy of Vince Senior to really load the cards up when Backlund took over uh, to make sure there were people in that building because there was a lot of disappointment when the kid took it, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know, speaking of Backlund, he's a, he's a very polarizing figure. And, you know, for somebody like myself in, in my, um, you know, mid to uh, early 30s, you know, I grew up on Backlund. So I, I have a little bit more of a love affair with him than other fans. But he's a very polarizing man. And I, I've heard you say different things. And I've talked to other guys on the show over the last, you know, so many years that have, you know, had the chance to work with Backlund. And they've described him as, as difficult to work with. Would you agree or disagree on that? Uh, yes. To the extent that he was actually um, petrified, literally uh, frozen with fear at someone, uh, referee wrestlers, double crossing him mm. and taking, uh, getting a fast count uh, uh, on the, uh, and, and getting that belt. He was, he was absolutely paranoid because he knew, uh, sadly, he was, uh, uh, he was a loner, you know. And uh, uh, he just he just didn't. There was something about his personality, the nicest guy in the world, but there was something about his personality. I think it was the fact that most of the boys felt that he was not uh, really deserving of, mm. uh, of of getting that title, especially when guys like you, well, actually before you, because of your age. Yeah. We're raised on Bruno San Martino. Right. 
Tennessee, and and it just there was a big, uh, and, and this is an amazing thing. This senior actually asked Dusty Rhodes and myself more than once how we could get this kid Bob Backman to get some sort of charisma. He was he was very lacking in real charisma, you know. Yeah, like Chris Jericho has great charisma he just charismatic you know right and and uh and we and dusty i told him you just can't um manufacture real charisma and vince senior knew that because he had been around all the uh, all the guys the sure. legends, you know and so that was that was one thing that um uh that i think uh hurt bobby in his uh acceptance on his, the peer level was because they felt that he uh, had not really uh, paid his dues as far as years and years and years mm -hmm. and really had proven himself because Vince, um, um, uh, Vince uh, he was relatively just uh, uh, an unknown, you know. Yeah. And uh, I, th there was a lot of uh, uh, disappointment uh, about uh, back from taking the, the belt. As a matter of fact, the cage match uh, with me and Bruno in a spectrum, which is a Saturday before the Monday that I gave that belt to Backlund in Madison Square Garden, Bruno was totally unaware that I was going to drop the uh, the drop the belt to Backlund two nights later in uh, Madison Square Garden. And he actually freaked out about it. Wow! He said, "How can Vince make this mistake? It's just..." And uh, it's very amazing because Bruno, Bruno, and you, next time you have him on, ask him about this. Definitely. I'm sure, I'm sure you remember, uh, uh, told me to um, suggest it, and I did fake an injury, a knee injury, uh, in our cage match so that I would go into the match in uh, Madison Square Garden with my knee wrapped and limping as I went into the ring to to devalue the title change because I had injury. That's a great story. I've read that <laughs> yeah. in your book. And yeah. I've heard you yeah. tell it many times. I love that story. That's an amazing story, yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, let, let me ask you this. You know, uh, you know I, I've read many times where, where you, uh, over the last uh, couple of years, you've extended your hand um, to help out a lot of the wrestlers that, that, that are maybe struggling with addiction or, or, or abuse. And, uh, uh, you know, one of your peers that's turned into a real tragic figure over the last couple of years is the Iron Sheik. And I'm curious uh, as to what your take is on uh, the Iron Sheik and if you're, you know, aware of uh, his, his current state. <clears throat> oh, yes. Yeah, I think all of us are aware. Uh, you know, I'm, I've been a subscriber to Dave Meltzer's newsletter oh, okay. uh, since the 90s, you know. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, I'm aware it's a tragic deal and uh, uh, have no idea w w why or how, uh, you know. Uh, I, I, think, I think it was just his nature to begin with that he was going to go down that self-destructive road, you mm -hmm. know. Uh, and uh, it's, 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 a, it's a horrible thing, and uh, we have no answers for it, you know, but it, it's, it's one of the modern, modern-day tragedies, you know. Yeah. Have you, have you ever had a chance to, uh, you know, ex extend your hand or, or, or talk to the Sheik over the last couple of years? Uh, no, I saw him when, and visited with him in Los Angeles, I think, two years ago now, maybe three at the uh, Hall of Fame and the WrestleMania. Oh, okay. Out in Los Angeles. We had a great visit out there, and... Uh, uh, but uh, uh, I, uh, I I didn't feel that I uh, was in a place to uh, to to, to um, advise or, or you know counsel him yeah. when I myself uh, was still having all kinds of difficulties you know yeah uh, uh, even though I overcame everything right right yeah. Um, you you were you were um, out there, uh, you know, very outspoken after the um, the horrific uh, Chris Benoit tragedy, and you know I ask you this with the way the current WWE schedule is and the pressures and the rigors, can a full time wrestler, a full time successful wrestler in the WWE function at, at the current state without any kind of dependency? I don't know about the personal level ability for the current guys to perform under the um, extensive traveling schedule 
I know that when I was champion, the year I had that belt, just about a full year, mm-hmm. uh, I was the first wrestler to take it out the Northeast, as, as you probably recall, uh, you know, going down to Florida with Dusty yep. and St. Louis, stuff like that. I wrestled around 330 times that year. Wow. And it was um, uh, it was absurd, but I, I uh, wanted to take advantage of it. And, uh, uh, and so... And I, w- I had my dependency. There was no way that me personally could have traveled, could have trained, could have dieted, could have done the uh, e- exhausting scheduling without chemical help. Right. And uh, it's just almost because, you know, Eric, you're going through different time zones. Yeah, you know you jet lag, and you and, and your and your system is so thrown off by jet lag, and and and, and the un the irregularity of your scheduling is just wrecks havoc on your physical body. You know. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I went out a couple of weeks ago, and uh, I do I do some announcing on the side. And I went out to do that San Francisco show, that big convention that they had. Oh, is that right? Yeah. I did the announcing for it. And, you know, here in Philly, I pretty much flew out. I I don't like to spend a lot of time in place, so I like to just fly out and come home. And I did that, and I remember saying to my friends, you know, man, I can't imagine how these those guys in the 80s could survive, you know, going from time zone to time zone, sometimes more than one in a day. Yes, of course. It it was strictly... uh uh, uh, I'll speak for myself on this, a chemical dependence. Uh, also, because a person like me, I had to, I had to throw in the factor of training in mm. a gym every day. Yeah. See, I had, I, I was a bodybuilder and, uh, to keep my look. I had to, I had to get there, fly to a town, rent a car, get a hotel room, eat, go to the gym, get back, get a, get a two-hour workout in. Go to the arena, uh, you know, uh, do your deal, get back, eat, go to bed, get up early the next morning, and do the same thing. Wow. See, so it's a it's a horrific, uh, destructive thing on your uh, on your on your system, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and I want to ask you uh, about this before we uh, take a break. Um, you know, during the uh, dur- during all the media appearances um, following that that horrific tragedy. Um, Ken Kennedy was a guy that stood up and, you know, pretty much called you out for being a hypocrite, called uh, everybody else speaking out against the WWE hypocrites. I had Bruno on that weekend that his comments came out, and Bruno just went nuts about the situation and uh, Kennedy. But Kennedy was a guy that actually, um, you know, more or less called you out specifically. Then a couple of weeks later, he wound up being suspended yes. on the wellness policy. What are your thoughts on that? Yes, that was a, that was a, a that, 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 that blindsided me, Eric. Um, uh, because I've always taken the heat for my own uh, steroid use and abuse. Never blame anyone except myself. Mm-hmm. Um, except a, a period of time when I tried to, I, when I did file a fictitious lawsuit against this man over a steroids issue. Uh, and I was very saddened by Kennedy's um, remarks because I had actually told him in person when I was uh, having my book tour in one of the towns, uh, and he was uh, coming off an injury, um, that uh, he he was so talented that he should never even consider using steroids to enhance his physique wow. because of his natural talking ability. And I, can, I told that he could be another Roddy Piper-type character. See? Yeah. And... Um, and he accepted my, uh, and my wife was sitting there with him when we had this hour-long discussion. And uh, it seemed that he really, really, he did have a lot of respect for me. And, and uh, it was just, I felt sad. Um, I counseled with Jim Ross over that Kennedy reaction. Mm-hmm. And Jim Ross told me that uh, he felt that Kennedy, being a great guy that he is, and I quote, which is a great term, just needed more time under the learning tree. Mm. Uh, a young guy and not really matured, and he just, uh, uh, and I sent an email directly to Kennedy uh, through through John Lord Knight as the secretary. Okay. And the first, my first interview that I did, it was on CBS, Katie Couric, National News, 
uh, CBS, and before I went on the air, Linda McMahon called me here in Phoenix from Stanford to thank me about going on the air and distancing the Benoit tragedy from steroids. Wow. I did that. That was my first interview, and uh, I got a personal phone call from Linda McMahon, yeah. and I reminded Ken Kennedy of that. Yeah. That Linda herself called me, and every interview I did, I distanced Benoit's tragedy from the use of steroids. Yeah, yeah. So I'm very, very disappointed, very disappointed in Kennedy because he was such a nice guy to me, and I, he probably still is a nice guy. Yeah. But then to make that stand and then to be exposed. Right. You see, that really, uh, and honestly, Honestly, Eric, I'm going on record right now on your show as saying, and you could and you could put this out there. I am disappointed that Ken Kennedy has not sent me an apology email. Wow, I thought that's I how need, you were gonna. I thought that's how you were gonna end the story that he wrote you back and apologized, etc. Yes, I was waiting. I was waiting. I've been waiting for that apology, and you know what? It has never come. And I'm going on record. I'm extremely disappointed in Ken Kennedy and his character. Mm. His character should have automatically said, wait a minute, let me reevaluate this situation and let me, let me go back and, 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 and do some research on all of the interviews that Billy Graham did. I was on, you know, I was out there. Sure. You know that. I was on a lot of television stations. Sure. And uh, I'm very disappointed. And you know what? Honestly, honestly, right now, I'm going to tell you right now. His failure, his failure to reach out to me and make amends was the final blow as far as me um, me recognizing uh, wrestlers as really good, honest human beings that most of them are. Mm. But it just, you know, it just crushed me. The guy didn't have the decency to send me an apology. Yeah. And has let me down in, in the quality of the character of professional wrestlers. Wow. Amen to that. Uh, Billy, I'm going to take a quick time out if you'd be so good to hang on. Uh, yes, possibly sir. when we come back from the break, we'll uh, squeeze in some calls for you. Yes, sir. Absolutely. Uh, fantastic. What a day it is. We are talking to the legend himself, superstar Billy Graham here on Pro Wrestling Radio. If you have a question for superstar Billy Graham, give us a call at 1-888-922-922. 2149. The phones are already ringing. 1 888 922 2149. You're listening to the show in a couple of places. One on the internet, live at WBCB1490.com. Archived on my website at ProWrestlingRadio.com. And on the air, WBCB 1490 AM. And now back to more wrestle talk with the man himself, Eric Gargiulo. Thank you very much, Bill Melody. And we are talking to the legend himself. Superstar Billy Graham, and we will take your calls momentarily. We have a couple on hold for the great superstar. But, Billy, I want to ask you this question. I'm real curious for your take on this. Um, I write a lot about wrestling, and I've written a lot over the last couple of months about TNA wrestling. And I don't know how familiar you are with things over there, but I've written a lot about them turning into a safe haven for guys that are failing drug tests in the WWE and rather than complying, deciding to opt out and just go to TNA on their own. And I've, I, you know, I, I've been able to cite many examples of that. I received a letter after the last article I wrote. The last article I wrote about was after Booker T wound up showing up over there. I received a letter from somebody in TNA management blasting me for writing about this and having denials for, for everything and all the individuals that I wrote about. And, and these are all documented cases. Uh, what is your take on what's going on with them all of a sudden, in my opinion anyway, turning into a safe haven for these guys that are, are failing the uh, wellness policy in the WWE? Uh, yes, yeah, that's a very good question, and, and I appreciate that. Personally, I cannot speak to um, the, uh, the the failures of drug policies or the non-failures of TNA. I can tell you that 
that their uh, their stance, evidently, that what I've read, and I'll go back to all I know mm-hmm. is what I read in my friend Dave Meltzer's newsletter. Mm-hmm. We're very, very uh, close personal friends, uh, Dave and I, and I take his uh, newsletter as gospel. As do I. Yes. And, uh, and 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 it is absolutely. Let me tell you something, Eric. It is absolutely the nature of the beast of pro wrestling to be dishonest, to to lie, to cheat, to steal, and to deceive. Because after all, you know, back in the day uh, when we were kayfaving everybody. Well, we were, we were, that was our sole goal, of course, was deception to make the thing uh, a reality. Mm -hmm. See, so we, we lived that deception. You know, it was like, you know, you know the stories of the the old school. Sure. Yeah, you know, and so, but that, there is, listen, listen to me right now, listen to me. There is nothing holy, there is nothing sacred about pro wrestling. So don't ever be shocked by anything <laughs> you hear, <laughs> by any denial of any professional wrestling organization. It is the nature of the sinful, deceptive beast of pro wrestling to deceive and continue to deceive. Yeah, yeah, okay? great. And now, let me throw this in about Bruno San Martino. Okay. I was at a, in August, I was at the big uh, convention, uh, Fan Fest in New York. Okay. Uh, out on Long Island. And, uh, and, and I was uh, talking to Terry Funk, my dear friend, Terry Funk. And we were talking about Bruno San Martino. And Terry Funk, as you know, as you may have read uh, uh, or heard at that convention, turned out to be a complete mark for Bruno San Martino wow. and his character. Wow. And I, he's talked about it and talked about it and is absolutely... And, and let me tell you something. Where, where Bruno San Martino, this man has never caused one public nuisance uh, incident as a professional wrestler. This man was a role model for, for fans and family to see a professional wrestler how he can really be. Mm. You see what I'm talking yeah. about? Yeah. And this guy never threw any furniture out of a hotel room, never caused a disturbance, never got drunk in public, never did drugs. And so I'm I'm just telling you that it can be done and Bruno San Martino is the the gold standard as far as character. Uh, in professional wrestling and all sports, of course. That's great. That's great. And uh, yeah, ter- Terry. Um, ironically enough, I, w- I had Terry Funk on one weekend prior to when I was having Bruno on the next Saturday, and that's exactly what he said. He uh, just went on about uh, Bruno's character, and he pointed uh, to an incident when Bruno was very loyal to Baba in Japan, even when Vince Senior was doing business with New Japan, causing all kinds of problems behind the scenes and uh bruno was very humbled when he heard terry's comments about that oh yes well uh you know i had a major i had a i i committed a major error sometime back when i publicly when i publicly um said that bruno san martino was bitter and was treating his son david unfairly Mm. Um, because of David's um, alleged steroid use many, many, many years ago. Right. And uh, <clears throat> I had misspoken that this convention in, in New York, Long Island. I personally went up to Bruno San Martino and apologized to him, one man uh, to another man, that I made a huge mistake by speaking publicly about people's private lives. And so I want to go on record again as saying that I've apologized to Bruno. He has, in fact, accepted my apology. Oh, that's great. And, uh, and so, so we moved on because, after all, as I told Bruno, it was him passing the torch to me that solidified 
my career and establish me as a uh, future Hall of Famer, uh, even though I was well on my way. But it was that that title, that ti- the gaining of that title, WWWF champion, that solidified my career to make it possible that you and I are talking today. Yeah, well, that's that's just fantastic. That that's just great. Um, and uh, we are talking to superstar Billy Graham. Let's uh, open up a call for uh, Billy Graham. And when we bring you up on the air, if you can just uh, you know state your name and uh, ask your question or questions, we'll um, bring you down, and then we'll allow the great superstar to respond. Uh, first question comes from Vince in Fairless Hills. Vince, how are you? I'm good. Excellent. Hey, I got two quick questions for the superstar. But first, it's nice just talking to you side by side. Uh, when I first start getting into wrestling, you were the first one, Roy, the muscles and the clothes and the attitude. And uh, I hate to say, I know Jesse followed behind you. Were you was he a protege of yours? And did you also have the opportunity to work for Vince? the father as well as the son and who would be nicer oh thank you very much uh for your for your questions well uh billy i guess we can take the uh second one first everybody you know uh maybe they're not aware uh you worked for vince senior for many many years and i guess uh maybe a comparison of the two oh uh vince senior okay vince senior extremely wonderful kind a gentleman a gentleman who had the class who just who just who just had a almost a halo around him of dignity and character and class. Not to say that Vince Jr. does not. Right. But this this was his this was his his uh, persona when Vince Senior walked in the room standing straight as an arrow and and very dignified looking and very courteous and, and, and polite and self assured. This man was the epitome and the gold standard of a wrestling promoter or a businessman, period. However, what he lacked, what Mr. McMahon Sr. lacked and Vince Jr. had in abundance was, and still does have in abundance, is the ability to promote merchandise. Mm. And sadly, Vince Sr. was not even interested in uh, creating T-shirts wow. as an avenue to bring in more revenue, uh, or even photographs. Nothing, absolutely zero interest in marketing. Well, lo and behold, his son had some good genes. Yeah, as far as the marketing <laughs> went, and, and 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 so what? The father did not have. The son has an abundance, and as a matter of fact. At Eddie Guerrero's funeral service here in Phoenix two years ago now that I could conducted, I made that statement uh, during the uh, service for Eddie Guerrero uh, with Vince sitting there in the uh, congregation mm-hmm. that indeed Vince McMahon is a marketing genius and will in fact be able to market Eddie Guerrero's uh, name and his uh, uh, everything associated with Eddie Guerrero uh, after death uh, as well as uh, while he was living in order to provide financial relief for Vicky Guerrero and his children. Yeah. And so this, that is your difference. See, uh, Junior is a mastermind a genius at marketing and will not miss a thing. Mm. Your senior was purely, purely involved and committed, dedicated to just the self-promotion of the business. Yeah, and uh, Vince's second question was he wanted to know if you had any hand in mentoring uh, Jesse Ventura when he more or less morphed into the superstar gimmick. I, oh, yes, of course. I never, I never uh, took Jesse aside and sat him down. Jesse in Minneapolis uh, tracked me down uh, where I was training at the, uh, uh, at the at the gym, uh, the Jack Sharky Jack Sharky's uh, 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 gym in, in on Hennepin Avenue, downtown Minneapolis, and introduced himself to me, and um, and we started talking, and and I could tell immediately that Jesse uh, 
had this enormous amount of charisma, mm. and uh, and I and he asked me what to do about his wrestling career, and I told Jesse Ventura the first thing you do, sir, is you get out of Minneapolis because they're not going to let you in with me here and you wanting to look and talk and act like me. Right. You see? Yeah. And they, and, and, they, and Vern Gagne and Wally Carbo, they actually told me personally to just, because Jesse Ventura would come up to the office and try to try to get in, and, and, and they, they saw Jesse Ventura as a nuisance. Wow. And they said, Superstar, please just don't even talk to Jesse Ventura. And I said, well, wait a minute, this is a nice guy. He just wants to be a wrestler. Yeah. You know? Like, that's all he wants is to be a wrestler. Yeah. So I told Jesse, the best thing for you, young man, is to leave this city, start your career, and then come back. Mm. And he took that advice, and that's what he did. Excellent, excellent. Now, uh, you know, we're, we're, we're facing the uh, very uh, real possibility that Congress may dissect the wrestling business and may choose to regulate it somehow. Um, what are your thoughts on that? Do you think that wrestling needs to have that big brother looking in, or do you think that it's too much of an intrusion? Well, well, uh, this, is the, this is the thing. I know we're running out of time yeah. here. And, and by the way, uh, sometime in the future, I would like to come back uh, to answer more questions from the fans. Oh, absolutely, uh, absolutely. Uh, to, to do that, uh, because I really enjoy uh, talking to the fans. That's one thing that we were forbidden to do mm. in the old school uh, era. Yeah. Was to, as you know, as a historian you are now yourself, yeah. uh, that we were just forbidden. And, and, and now it's like, it, it's fun. It's inter I, I enjoy it. So I'd like to, uh, in the future, after the first year, maybe come back. And oh, absolutely. Maybe we'll, we'll talk and maybe sometime uh, towards the end of January we can put something together. Yes, yes. Yeah, uh, that would be great. That oh, that'd be my, my pleasure and honor. Excellent. So, uh, yeah, but but about Congress, if you can give me maybe like a, a sixty to ninety uh, quick second uh, answer on uh, your thoughts about Congress uh, taking a look at wrestling. Yes, I think that Congress and the government, uh, especially in light of Barry Bonds being uh, ushered into court yesterday, as we all saw, mm -hmm. pleading not guilty to perjury. Uh, two counts of perjury and one count of obstruction of justice. As a legitimate professional baseball player, speaks volumes as to the culture that we live in. Um, and we expect professional wrestlers to be deceptive, and the public does too, because they know we're just entertainers and we're not a legitimate sport. Yeah. But however, when it goes to the level of a Barry Bonds deceiving the general public uh, and enhancing his uh, performance um, and the government now going to court with him, uh, I think it's, it's the good for all of humanity, period, to try to eliminate drugs in professional sports. Wow, well said, well said. Billy, uh, real quick, do you have anything you want to promote or anything? Uh, uh, no, just uh, uh, the fans that don't have, uh, never gotten my DVD, I know they would enjoy that. Uh, I think you'll enjoy that more than the book because of all the uh, uh, all the clips and everything in there. And uh, uh, it's just been a pleasure to be on this show, Eric. And let's stay in touch. Definitely. And uh, you know, we'll get we'll get back on here after the first year sometime. You know. Excellent, excellent. Happy holidays to you. And uh, really, uh, truly, a real honor today. And uh, thanks for uh, coming on. And I can't wait to have you back. You're welcome, and thank you very much, and uh, uh, God bless everybody, and everybody have a great Christmas coming up, okay, buddy? All right, thank you, Superstar. Thank you. All right, Bye -bye. take care. There you go, Superstar Billy Graham, exclusively here on Pro Wrestling Radio. Uh, if you missed any of the interview, I will have it on my website at uh, sometime uh, during the weekend. You can download it at ProWrestlingRadio.com. That's Pro Wrestling Radio. Dot com. Uh, well, it's about uh, that time for me to wrap it up. I want to thank Bill Melody for making things happen on this end of the board. And uh, Bill will be following me until 6 o'clock with the Country Music Hall, exclusive country music all day on WBCB. And then Bill will be back tomorrow morning from 5 to 10 a.m. 
ProWrestlingRadio.com is my website. My column runs on PhillyBurbs.com in the blog section, The Camel Clutch. I will humble you. We'll see you next Saturday at 12.05 on WBCB.